Okay, uh, so welcome back. So in yesterday's lecture, we ended with a discussion of density matrices. Um, so I wrote down for you the general form of a density matrix for a system and also asked you to prove a couple of things about density matrices. So I hope you've uh, tried doing that. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at subsystems because that's what we're interested in and try to and first define what the density matrix of a subsystem is, how you obtain the density matrix of a subsystem starting with a density matrix of the full system um, where you'll encounter the concept of a partial trace. And then having done that, we sort of develop most of the basic concepts that are required to look at thermalization in um, quantum systems. So that's what we'll do uh, after we finish our discussion on um, <coughs> subsystems and density matrices for subsystems. So, uh, wait, is there more white chalk? Okay, never mind. So do you want me to start writing from here or here? Okay, fine. All right. So what we have in mind is a system, which is, let's say, this box, and some partitioning of the system into a subsystem and the rest of the system, which I'm going to refer to as a bath. So the system is divided into a subsystem and a bath. And <clears throat> the subsystem has its own Hilbert space. The bath has its own Hilbert space. Okay. So what we're doing is we're partitioning the degrees of freedom of the whole system into some which belong to the subsystem and the rest which belong to the bath. And the degrees of freedom of each of them make up a Hilbert space. Okay. So then the first question is, if I know, for instance, if I say that the full system is in a pure state, meaning that the full system has a certain wave function or a certain state psi, how do I write psi in terms of states for the subsystem and the bath? Okay. And this is something which I'm assuming that all of you have seen before, that the Hilbert space of the full system is a product of the Hilbert space of the subsystem and the bath. So in general, I can write down <clears throat> the state of the full system in the following form. Let me be consistent with the notation that I have here. Okay. So this is going to be of the form summation i j where the set of states phi i s form a, a basis, a complete orthonormal basis for the subsystem and the set of states phi j b form a basis the bath B. Okay, so what we're saying is that the that a quantum state of the whole system is basically a sum of products of this sort. Okay, so you have um, a state, <coughs> one of these states for S, multiplying one of these states for B, multiplying in the sense of a tensor product, and then you look at a sum of such products, and that gives you a general state for the whole system. All right, so this is um, the state for the whole system. Now what we can do is, for the state for the whole system, we can construct a density matrix. So we saw how you can construct a density matrix for a pure state yesterday. So the density matrix corresponding to this is just that operator, which acts on the Hilbert space of the full system. Now, what we're interested in now is to obtain a density matrix for the subsystem given this density matrix for the full system. Okay. And so the way we do it is completely analogous to the way we obtained a distribution for a subsystem in the classical case, 
given a distribution for the full system. So what we did was we integrated out the degrees of freedom of the full system, which were not contained in the subsystem. Here, the equivalent of integrating out the degrees of freedom is tracing out those states, performing a mathematical trace operation on this, on the states of this Hilbert space, okay? So that you get something which is an operator that acts on this Hilbert space, only on the system. And that operator is basically the density operator, the density matrix for the subsystem, okay? So therefore, rho subsystem is going to be a partial trace, a trace over the bath degrees of freedom of rho, okay? And what is a partial trace? So a partial trace is the following. So trace E of rho, let me just use a different symbol. Okay, so let's say K is So these five Ks can be, you can, <clears throat> so these five Ks form an orthonormal basis for the bath. You can take them to be the same as these. You can take exactly the same orthonormal basis that you use to define this. Or it turns out you could take any other orthonormal basis. It doesn't matter because you're performing a trace. Okay, so as all of you would know that when you perform a trace on a matrix or an operator, it doesn't matter on what basis you have represented the, the matrix. It, you know, if you perform a similarity transformation to take the matrix to some other form and some other basis, you still end up with the same trace. And exactly the same thing happens here. But for us, it's just convenient to take this basis to be the same as that because we've written out the state in this basis, okay? So this is what we mean by performing a partial trace. And you can see that this state is something which is a sum of products of this sort. Whereas in performing the partial trace, you're tracing only over this, okay, and not over that. So the resultant object that you get after tracing is something which is going to be a sum of products of the form where you have, in each term of the product, you're going to have one ket for this, you know, what, you're going to have some ket for this state multiplying some bra for this state. Okay, I'll write it down in just a second. So that is going to have the form of an operator on this subsystem, and that is a density matrix, the density operator. So in this particular case, when you perform the, the trace, what you'll find is that rho s is going to be equal to, <coughs> excuse me, summation, C I P C K P star um, Y I S Y K S and P and this so this is something which has the form where you have Every term is some ket, which is acting on the subsystem, multiplying a bra on, this, on the same subsystem. But you can see that these don't have to be the same, okay? Because of the fact that when you calculate this reduced density matrix in this particular basis that we've chosen, it doesn't have to come out to be diagonal in that basis, okay? So it's going to, so these would be the same only if this were diagonal. And there's some basis in which this is diagonal. You can always, it's like any other operator which is acting on the subsystem. So once you have obtained it, you can then write that operator in a particular basis such that it looks diagonal and such that these indices would be the same. But in general, that, that's not the case if you start by representing this in some random basis, okay? All right. So again, an exercise for you is to show that the, so this is called the reduced density matrix, 
Okay, I think it is a KP star, but you could work it out and see if I've made a mistake. All right, it's just, um, okay. So this is a reduced density matrix. And so now what you can show, I mean, this is an exercise is this, that the trace of the reduced density matrix. So now the reduced density matrix is, act, is an operator only uh, in the Hilbert space of S. So now when you're taking a trace of this, you're tracing over the states in S. So this has to have, so show that this has trace one, just like any other density matrix. And also that its eigenvalues lie in this interval between zero and one, just like for the regular density matrix. That, so what this, so this is to basically show that the reduced density matrix has exactly the properties of any other density matrix. It is a bona fide density matrix for the subsystem. Now, it turns out that this density matrix that we started with doesn't have to be of this form for you to be able to define a reduced density matrix for the subsystem. This could have been anything. I mean, I chose it to be of this form so that we got a simple expression like this. But in general, you could have any general row, which doesn't have to correspond to a pure state. And from that, you could obtain the reduced density matrix, employing exactly the same mathematical operation of tracing over the degrees of freedom of the bar. Okay? So this is the reduced density matrix. And once the reduced density matrix has been obtained, because it's like any other density matrix, you can then use this for various calculations. So for instance, if you wanted to calculate the expectation value of some particular operator that belongs to the subsystem, when the full system happens to have this density matrix, then what you do is you calculate the reduced density matrix and the expectation value of some operator A is then going to be this, where A is an operator that's defined on the Hilbert space of S, okay? Right, so, <clears throat> so this is something which you can do. Then another thing which you can do, which is going to be very important for us, is to define the entropy corresponding to the reduced density matrix, the von Neumann entropy. So that is, defined in exactly the same way as the entropy for the density matrix um, that I'd written down yesterday. So it's minus trace of rho s log rho s. Okay. And this, for at least a specific situation when rho is, when rho, the, the, the density matrix of the whole system corresponds to a pure state, this is something that's called the entanglement Entropy. Okay. So what does the entanglement entropy do? So you can see that if the state that we started with was not a sum of products, so suppose the state that we started with was just a product of a state belonging here and a state belonging there. Okay. So that was our initial state. And then you went through this mathematical operation of tracing out the bar degrees of freedom. What you will find is that for such a state, the reduced density matrix will also correspond to just a pure, just a pure state for the, the subsystem, okay? And so then if you, if you ended up with that kind of reduced density matrix, and if you calculated the entanglement entropy, it would turn out to be zero, okay? So product states for the full system have zero entanglement entropy, have no entanglement, okay? Now, sorry? Okay. So suppose your psi, the state psi, was equal to some state phi of the subsystem times some, uh, some state phi tilde of the bar. Okay. Suppose it had this form, right? So you, <clears throat> so you should note that 
this form is much more general than that. This is a special case of this form when the coefficients have a certain structure. But suppose this, suppose I chose a state which had this form, and then I went through this mathematical operation of tracing out the bas degrees of freedom. What you would find is, so rho is once again this, and now what you would find is that rho s, after you went through this whole procedure, would just be equal to that. Okay? So rho s would also have the form of a pure state. Right? So for specific kinds of pure states of the whole system, the density matrix that you get for the subsystem also has the form of a pure state. Now if you have a density matrix which looks like this, okay, and then if you were to calculate the entropy for it as we discussed yesterday, that entropy would turn out to be zero. Right, so this is so this is saying that for this particular mic for this kind of microstate for the whole system, the subsystem is also in exactly one microstate. Okay. Um, this this okay. So I should point out since I you know I did make a big deal of this earlier that this is very much like what happens in the classical case, right? So in the classical case we said that if you know that the full system is in one particular microstate, then every subsystem also is in a particular microstate. Right? It's not in a distribution of microstates. So these are the quantum states which are the equivalent of such classical states. So these states in some sense, and you know, we'll look at these in more detail and also understand the sense a little bit more in the last lecture. These states are like classical states in this Hilbert space. Okay? So, so, this is, so this entanglement entropy turns out to be zero when you have a state like this for the full system. On the other hand, if you had something which was actually a sum of products, which was not something which you could factorize like this, which actually had, was a sum of products, then you would not get um, a density matrix for the subsystem which would look like something for a pure state. It would, you know, it would be, it would, it would be a sum like this. And then if you were to calculate the entanglement entropy, you would find that it's not zero. And once again, just like for the regular density matrix, um, the, the maximum value of the entanglement entropy or the maximum value of the entropy for the subsystem is simply going to be equal to log n, where n is now the dimension of the Hilbert space of the subsystem. So once again, this entropy, this entanglement entropy is between 0 and log n. And 0 means a pure state. Log n means you know, as mixed a state as you can possibly get, equal weights for all states. So the entanglement entropy, if you like, is measuring the amount of mixedness in the state of the subsystem. How close is it to being a pure state? Okay, so I mean, the, the smaller the entanglement entropy is, the closer it is to being a pure state. And the closer the entanglement entropy is to log n, the closer it is to being you know, completely unbiased towards any state. Okay, so, um, so the reason this is important is that this object, rho s, is going to, is, is essentially, okay, rather, maybe not for this particular case, this, in the general case, this object rho s is, the distribu is like the distribution function for the subsystem. Yeah, yeah, so, so that, is, that is, in some sense, in the basic structure of combining two Hilbert spaces to get one Hilbert space, huh? Right. Okay. So if psi, okay, if 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 the state of the full system was not a pure state, then it wouldn't look like this. Then what would happen is that you would still be able to define size, individual size for the full system. But then you would have to assign a priori probabilities to those size, and the density matrix then would look something like this. It would be right. So this was the kind of density matrix that we wrote down yesterday. And then what you would have to do is you would have to take these size, each of these size, and decompose those size in this form. So that's what would happen if your, if the full system was not in a pure state. No, 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 of course. 
So what the entanglement entropy is will define or will depend on how you partition the system into a subsystem and a bar. So if you choose a different, you know, if you choose a different subsystem and, you know, something smaller or something which bigger or something else and say an S prime and correspondingly a B prime, then for the same psi you will get a different entanglement entropy. It will depend on the choice of your subsystem, exactly. So, so that is a very special density matrix. The I by N density matrix that we got was for, this, for the particular case where we said that all states, all microstates in the Hilbert space had the same a priori probability. In that particular case, the density, but now we are talking in, in very general terms. There is some density matrix for the whole system from which you can obtain a density matrix for the subsystem. All right. So, so, all right. So, coming back to the importance of this. So, this is going to be the density operator, the density you know, which you will use to calculate things like this for the subsystem. So, for instance, if you wanted to look at the derivation of the canonical ensemble from the from the microcanonical ensemble in this system, where you say that the whole system is isolated, and let's say you know it has a certain amount of energy, and then you look at a subsystem and you look at the bath and then you say that these are weakly coupled so that you can divide the energy into an energy for the subsystem plus the energy for the bath and you take the size of the bath to infinity right which is what you do to derive the canonical ensemble then what you will find is that this object rho s is going to turn out to be and, and we'll go over this derivation uh, probably tomorrow when we discuss something called canonical typicality this object in that particular case is going to look like this, where beta is a temperature and that temperature is going to depend on the energy of the full system and also on details of the full system like density of states and so on, like the entropy function of the full system, that's going to give you this. But so this is just to tell you that this object that we've calculated in this formal way will in specific situations reduce to things that you are quite familiar with, for instance, something like this, okay? So what's interesting now is that if you have, if you're, if the state of the full system was actually a pure state like this, from which you were obtaining rho s and that rho s were to look like this, okay, then what you're essentially saying is that the that this distribution which you've got is the same as this one. Or in other words, if you were to now calculate the entropy, the entanglement entropy, the entanglement entropy would just be the regular thermodynamic entropy that you talked about, right? Because if, you know, if I just gave you this, and I didn't tell you that this originated from, uh, you know, a calculation like this by, you know, by, that this was the entanglement entropy in a particular state, if I just told you that, here's your subsystem, here's rho s at some temperature, then you would say that the entropy is nothing but minus trace of rho s log rho s, which is exactly this object. So if the system, if the subsystem thermalizes, then it has to be that the entanglement entropy is the same as the thermodynamic entropy, okay? They're the same thing. And that was very important because, you know, that might seem like a trivial thing in the way I've developed this, but it actually has a very important consequence which is going to be very useful for us. So you know that the thermodynamic entropy is an extensive object, right? Which means that if I took this, you know, if I come back, if I look at the system again, and I do the same thing for a different subsystem, which was twice in size, in physical extent, but otherwise had the same intensive quantities, like the same density or the same energy, you know, the same, the, the, right, the same average density of particles, the same average energy density, then what's going to happen is that my entropy is going to double. So that's, so that's the meaning of the entropy being an extensive quantity. So that tells us that if this were obtained from the entanglement entropy of a pure state, the entanglement entropy has to be an extensive quantity that the entanglement entropy, that the entropy of entanglement between some subsystem which has a certain volume and the rest of the system 
assuming the rest of the system is very large, has to scale as the volume of the subsystem. I double the volume, the entanglement entropy goes up. Okay? And the reason this is important is that this, in some sense, is a signature of thermalization. So when you're looking at, at concrete physical models, which we will, and you're looking at states of such a system, you know, these kinds of states, and you want to find out if the system were to be in that state, would subsystems thermalize, would a given subsystem thermalize? One diagnostic for whether that happens is this. You, so you can calculate the entanglement entropy and see whether it scales as the volume. Okay. If it doesn't scale as the volume, you know that it can't be a thermodynamic entropy. So this is a very important diagnostic, and um, and and we'll and we'll you know look at this in some detail. Um, now, one thing which is um, of so so is that is that point clear to everyone? So let me just write that down. S is minus tra trace rho S log rho S. Okay, so rho S thermal, and by thermal I mean if it's something that looks like this, implies that S scales as the volume of the subsystem. And I'm going to write that scaling as L to the power of D. So imagine that this system was in D spatial dimensions, okay? And the subsystem had some typical length L. Then S is going to scale as L to the D. As I increase the size of the subsystem, keeping all the aspect ratios the same, this is what's going to happen. So this, this is, look, you can, you can obtain an entropy from any kind of ensemble. So the thing about, okay, so right now I've just said that, assume that, you know, after you do all of this, the sub, what you get for the subsystem, rho s, is this canonical distribution. But the assumption when you, you know, when you, when you get this, the assumption is that the only thing that the subsystem is exchanging with the bath is energy. Of course, it could exchange other things like particles or other conserved quantities. And when that happens, you have you have distribution functions which look different. For instance, if it could also exchange particles, then you would have something like this, which with this object called a chemical potential, which you've seen. And um, you know, so that would be the distribution function. And this is uh, something that you get in what's called the grand canonical ensemble. But even if you had this, it is still true that the entropy would be defined this way, and the entropy would do this. Okay? So the entropy has to be an extensive quantity. And so the point here is, of course, what's important is also the coefficient in front of the L to the D. Okay? So the coefficient in front of the L to the D is what you call the specific entropy. Right, is the entropy per unit volume. Now, as we'll see, there are going to be systems where the entropy, I think we'll get to that point, I'm not sure, but there will so there are systems where S scales as L to the D, but the coefficient in front actually doesn't turn out to be the thermodynamic specific entropy. So those are systems where you do have this volume law scaling, but they don't thermalize. So this is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for something to thermalize, okay? Um, however, if this doesn't hold, it's a necessary condition, you know that it's not thermal. Okay? Um, so the one remark that I want to make about this is that, you know, I said that the coefficient in front, let's call it S, is the specific entropy. Now let's just go back to this case of the canonical ensemble, just to keep things simple for the subsystem. So here the only parameter that S would depend on is the temperature, because you can see that S has to be intensive, right? S is something, this little S is something which can't scale with the volume of the system. So it has to be intensive, and the only intensive quantity that I have here is the temperature, okay? So S is going to be a function of temperature, and in general what happens is that as the temperature goes to zero, this little S of T goes to zero, okay? So then you would say that for t equal to zero, s, you know, if you just take, if you just look at this, this will tell you that s is equal to zero for t equal to zero. Now, capital T equal to zero implies here that the full system is in its ground state, okay? So if you actually took that literally, you would conclude that the ground state of any quantum system 
has zero entanglement entropy when you divide it into a subsystem in a bar. But it turns out that that's not true because the entanglement entropy that you calculate could have subleading corrections to this, right? So you have L to the D, and then you could have something which could go as L to the D minus one and, you know, smaller powers of L. Now, in the thermodynamic limit, those are not important. If this coefficient is non-zero, right? If this coefficient is non-zero, even if you had something here which was something to the power of L to the D minus one and so on, and this were not zero, you wouldn't worry about those, right? In the limit of the subsystem being very large. But if this was strictly zero, like for the ground state, then you will have to start worrying about those. So it turns out that the statement, you know, the naive statement that you might make from here that the ground states of, of quantum systems have zero entanglement entropy is not correct. They typically have subleading terms, okay? And there's, you know, it's quite, and the structure of the subleading terms can be quite interesting. And um, I don't know, maybe in the lecture series on conformal field theory by John Cardi, he'll talk about what happens for particular kinds of ground states which are critical. Um, are you going to talk about the entanglement? Uh, okay, in your colloquium. All right, so, so, so please attend his colloquium today and he's going to talk about, you know, these kinds of non-volume law terms for ground states. But I, so this is just to tell you that, you know, these terms are important. And for systems which thermalize when you're not looking at zero temperature, these are not, but for ground states, they are. And as we'll see for systems which don't thermalize, these terms are important even when you are not at, in quotes, zero temperature. Okay. All right. Right. Yeah, except that here I'm assuming that I've taken B to infinity, right? So what happens is that when you look at the entanglement between two things, then the dimension of the reduced density matrix is going to be the dimension of the smaller Hilbert space. So here, because I've taken B to infinity, it has to be just this. So, so what I'm saying is that I've taken B to infinity first, and then I'm taking L to infinity. Yeah, so here I'm making the assumption, okay. So in order to get to this from that, where this is, you know, whatever, something like this, I'm making the assumption here that I can write down the Hamiltonian for the full system as a sum of the Hamiltonian for the subsystem and the Hamiltonian for the bath, okay? Now, in general, there's also going to be an H coupling. There's going to be some, some term in the Hamiltonian of the full system, which will have a coupling between the, the subsystem degrees of freedom and the bath degrees of freedom, okay? So, to get to this point from there, I'm assuming that this is much smaller than that in some sense, okay? That the coupling is very weak, so that just so, so that, you know, I can pass the total degrees, just like I can pass the total number of degrees of freedom of the full system into a set for the subsystem and a set for the bath, I can also pass the energy of the full system into something which belongs to the subsystem and something which belongs to the bath, and I don't have to worry about what the coupling is, okay? But in general, of course, you could have a system and, you know, situation, and this is going to be important for might, uh, as we defined it yesterday, where this subsystem need not be particularly large. It could be very small, right? In which case, there's no reason to say that the coupling H is smaller than the subsystem H. So you could, of course, still do everything in that case, but what will happen is that your final row S will not look like this. It's not going to be some nice, um, you know, function of just the Hamiltonian of the subsystem. It's going to have some other terms, which might, you know, look like, in quotes, some stochastic terms coming from the bath. No, no, I don't, I don't need the thermo, I don't need any thermodynamic limit for, for S for the notion of thermalization, okay? So that I can, I defined thermalization yesterday, uh, uh, you know, what I call might thermalization, which was basically saying the following, that you start the full system out in some state, you let it evolve for an amount of time which is larger than some reasonable time scale, look at the state of the full system, obtain the reduced density matrix, and check whether the reduced density matrix that you've got is equal to the reduced density matrix that you would have got from a canonical 
or from a micro canonical density matrix for the whole system at that energy, okay? But neither of those things has to look like this necessarily. They just have to be equal to each other for me to say that thermalization has occurred for the subsystem. Now, that was going to look like this in the special case when I can ignore this. And typically the reason that you ignore this is, you know, you either say that this, the, the coupling contributions, you know, are weak and they're weak because of the fact that they are only along the area of the subsystem, okay? And, uh, and if you take the, subs the subsystem to be sufficiently large, the volume contribution is going to overwhelm the area contribution, so you can throw it away. But you certainly don't need that in order to define thermalization. You need that in order to argue that rho s is this. Um, okay, any other questions? All right. Oh, yeah. Sorry? A different notation for... Uh... No, no, okay. So here, so here, look. The thing is that I'm talking about a quantum system. Rho s is an operator. For a classical system, you have a canonical density function, okay, which is going to be something like this. For a classical system, You write the canonical density operator as something like this. You, know, you write it as e to the minus beta e i divided by z. This is the form in which you have seen it, okay? Where e i is the energy of a particular microstate of the subsystem, and then this is the density operator. Now, this is going to give you exactly the same thing. Um, except here, there are no, you know, this is, this is a density function, it's not an operator, there's no Hilbert space that this is acting on. Here, this is acting on the Hilbert space of the subsystem, okay? But if you were to look at its matrix elements, it's an operator, and if you were to look at, yeah, if you were to look at its matrix elements, you would find that this operator would be diagonal in the basis in which the Hamiltonian is diagonal, and the matrix elements would be exactly these things, where E, I are the energy eigenvalues of H. No, no. So th this is an ent is an entropy that I can define for a given density operator. Different notation. No, no. It's look. You give me a density operator, I can define an entropy. Okay. Now the question is, where is this density operator coming from? If it is coming from a row which looks like this, right? Then this is an entanglement entropy, and then you know, and so this is. This serves as a thermodynamic entropy and also as the entanglement entropy. They're the same. Oh, the temp okay, the temperature or comes from the following fact that I'm assuming that this whole system, the larger system, is something which is isolated. Its energy is conserved, right? So it, it's undergoing Schrodinger evolution with a constant energy. And I also have a notion of density of states with this. If you give me an energy, I can tell you how many states there are in some small energy shell centered at that energy, okay? So that allows me to define an entropy as a function of energy for the whole system. So the beta that you have here, when this happens, so the beta that you have here is just equal to this object for the whole system. That is, so you know, this is exactly the way you get, even in the classical case, this is exactly what happens. There's nothing different that's happening in the quantum case. Okay. All right. So let me uh, move ahead. Okay. Fine. So right. So the main thing here is that, as you can see from this discussion, that for a quantum system, you can actually end up with a row S which doesn't look like this, even when the starting row looks like this. In other words, when you start out with the whole system in a pure state. The subsystem can still be in a mixed state, okay? And this is because of entanglement. How mixed it is, is, is quantified by the entanglement, okay? And therefore, for a quantum system, you have the possibility of a subsystem actually having something like a thermal distribution, even when you're starting out from a pure state for the whole system. Microstate for the whole system implies distribution for a subsystem. And that is special to quantum mechanics, and that is what is special to thermalization in quantum systems. So this 
demonstrates that. Okay. Um, and so, 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 so this is a notion that we are going to pursue. Okay, fine. So now let's look at another thing, um, another concept which comes up in classical thermalization, which we sort of briefly discuss without going into details, and see how that the naive notion of that doesn't work for a quantum system. Okay. So remember that we said that for a classical system, what was important for thermalization in the ensemblist point of view was chaos. So we needed to have some notion of starting out with starting the classical system out with some compact distribution in phase space, waiting long enough, and then having that distribution densely cover the, the entire constant energy surface in phase space, right? For which we need to have, and, and the evolution is basically Hamiltonian evolution. You have these trajectories. So these trajectories need to move far apart from one another. They need to go from all these phase points being confined here to densely covering this region and do it in a reasonable amount of time, okay? For which you need these trajectories to diverge very rapidly with time. So it turns out that, you know, so there's a whole literature devoted to that, but that is the basic notion of chaos, this rapid, this rapid divergence, and in fact, an exponential divergence. So now you can ask the same question about a quantum system. So imagine now that you, for the quantum system, you don't start it out in a pure state, you actually start the whole system out in some mixed state. Again, uh, confined to some small uh, region with a small Hilbert space of this energy shell. And then you let it evolve, okay? And then you ask, well, you know, what is the equivalent of this? So here the problem is that in the quantum system, if you were to naively try to generalize this divergence of trajectories, you would see that there is no divergence. Because these trajectories are basically defined by the evolution of microstates. Here we've agreed that a microstate is given by a wave function, like a, a state here. Okay. So if you now ask what is the distance between two microstates? So in order for me to even talk about this kind of divergence of trajectories, I need a notion of distance, which is increasing exponentially with time. And you can ask, well, you know, if I give you an abstract object like this, two abstract objects like this, what is the notion of a distance between them? Okay. So, but this is something which you have presumably, you know, seen before. So one, so the most common notion of distance between these objects is this. So you can define a distance between a psi and a phi as this, okay? Where this object, so if I take um, this, this is something called the norm, right? So in case it seems mysterious to you, this is exactly analogous to when you have, if you just look at regular three-dimensional space, and I give you one point with a position vector R1, another point with a position vector R2, you know that the distance between R1 and R2 right, is just going to be So this is just the generalization of that to a more abstract vector space. So you could, you know, you could look at this distance using this definition, and you can see that that distance essentially involves, just like in this case, taking scalar products between these vectors, okay? So here's now the thing about the quantum system, which makes this notion of distance changing rapidly as a function of time impossible. And the reason is that we know what the evolution of this kind of state ket is as a function of time, right? So we know that psi as a function of t is equal to this object, right? So similarly, if you look at phi as a function of t, that is going to be equal to that object. And so from this, you can see that 
the scalar product between psi and phi, and also, of course, between psi in itself and phi in itself, is essentially going to be independent of time. And that's a consequence of this kind of evolution, which is unitary evolution. So unitary evolution will not allow something like this to change as a function of time, okay? So this naive notion, if you wanted to just import this naive notion into quantum mechanics, that you have microstates which, as they evolve, are diverging rapidly as a function of time, you know, the distance between them is increasing exponentially as a function of time, you can't do that with a quantum system. A quantum system with its simple dynamics will not allow that to happen. So clearly, if we have to if we have to import the notion of chaos into the, if we have to import the notion of chaos into quantum mechanics, there has to be a different notion of chaos. We can't do this because this is not going to work. So put another way, what's happening in a classical system is that the reason that you have chaos is because of the dynamics. Right? The dynamics can be quite complicated. For a quantum system, the dynamics is in principle very simple. Right? It's just it's just this, the Schrodinger equation, which is going to give you this kind of unitary evolution. And because the dynamics is simple, the evolution is not going to give you chaos. So if there is any notion of chaos, it has to be present independent of the evolution, okay? Now this is actually a fairly, you know, fundamental thing and difficult to digest. And if you ask, well, what do we have in the quantum system that's independent of evolution? The only thing we have in the quantum system that is independent of evolution are the states themselves, you know, whatever states we started. So the whole point here is that for a quantum system, when you're talking about chaos, the notion of chaos is in the states themselves, not in the evolution. So somehow there is some notion of chaos which is encoded in the states themselves. And this is the thing which tells you that there could be a notion like states themselves being thermal and therefore chaotic. And that is what underlies what's called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which we'll look at, okay? All right, so this is, um, but, but this is an important notion, uh, so I thought I'd mention that. Okay, so then in the early days of trying to understand thermalization in quantum systems, a lot of attention was devoted to trying to understand what chaos would mean for a, for a, for a quantum system, given that this notion doesn't work, okay? So this entire exercise sort of goes under the broad heading of quantum chaos, okay? How do you characterize chaos in a quantum system? So the approach that was taken was to characterize chaos in a quantum system in terms of what it is not. So first see if we can understand what is not chaotic in a quantum system, and then say that anything which doesn't have that property is chaotic. So that was sort of the philosophy that was adopted. So in order to define what is not chaotic, the approach was to go back to classical systems and ask what kind of classical systems are not chaotic. So, as I said, classical systems, whether they're chaotic or not, depends on the dynamics. So, what kind of systems have dynamics which, in some sense, are sufficiently constrained that there is no chaos? So, all right, so, not, so what is not chaotic? So that's the question, right? So, classically, the answer was well known. So classically systems with, of course, you, know, you can have trivial systems like the, you know, like the, the, os the single oscillator with one degree of freedom, which is in some sense trivially not chaotic. But once you have more degrees of freedom, more complicated systems, classically the answer is that systems which are not chaotic are what are called integrable systems, okay? So what is an integrable system? So let's go back to classical mechanics again for a second. So we have, so classically we start with a system with n degrees of freedom okay, so once again think of the gas that we started with, n molecules, so n, so the number of, actually sorry, um, n molecules, so three n degrees of freedom, so you could define the number of degrees of freedom as a number of position coordinates. So system with n degrees of freedom, okay? 
So a classically integrable system is one where if it has n degrees of freedom, it has n functionally independent And I'm actually not going to try to define this very seriously, although you know that, that's an important issue, what functionally independent means. And functionally independent quantities which I'm going to label capital I sub I, I goes from one to n, which have the following property. So these, so these have the property that their Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian is equal to zero, and their Poisson brackets with one another are also equal to zero. So when this happens, these quant when this happens, these quantities are said to be in involution. Okay, so it has n functionally independent quantities which are in involution. Now the significance of the first statement is, you know that. For any quantity in classical mechanics where you have Hamiltonian dynamics, the time evolution of that quantity, unless it has an explicit time dependence itself, and these quantities don't, if it doesn't have any explicit time dependence itself, its time dependence, its derivative as a function of time is given by its Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian. So if that is equal to zero, that tells you that these quantities do not evolve in time. Okay? So these are conserved quantities. These are quantities whose values are not changing as a function of time. I, I is conserved okay. and they have this property. Now what this allows you to do is the following thing. It allows you to write down the <coughs> Hamiltonian itself, you know, which you would normally write down in terms of the position and the momentum coordinates. You, would, you, could, you, write, you can write it down in terms of these conserved quantities. is equal to zero if i is not equal to j. So if these are different quantities, their Poisson bracket is equal to zero. Right. If they're the same quantity, then you know trivially the Poisson bracket is equal to zero. That is I mean, that that's a given. So I'm saying that even when they're different quantities, their Poisson bracket is equal to zero. All right. So then you can write down the Hamiltonian in terms of these quantities. The Hamiltonian is time independence over these. And Conjugate to each of these quantities is something called <clears throat> an angle variable. So there is a sense in which, if you've done Hamilton-Jacobi theory, that these things can be identified with what are called action variables, and then canonically conjugate to those, you have angle variables. Now, what is the importance of this? So the importance of this is that you can actually write down the Hamiltonian in terms of these action angle variables, which can serve in some sense as momenta and positions themselves, just like regular momenta and positions. Okay, so there is what's called a canonical transformation between the momenta and the positions and these things, which allows these and their conjugate variables to serve as positions and momenta, okay? So <clears throat> what happens as a result, so you can write H in terms of these, So if H is in terms of just the I's and not their canonical variables, okay, which are, so by the way, let me just say I and theta I are canonically conjugate. Okay. And if H is just a function of I, and because these are canonically conjugate, these obey Hamilton's equations as well. So this would imply that the corresponding theta i dots are equal to zero, right? Or in other words, the time evolution of these angle variables is trivial. Huh? Sorry? Um, 
Right, sorry, sorry, sorry. Right, sorry, you're right. Thank you. Two function of yeah. yeah. If it was zero, then theta would be a constant. Thank you. So it's just a function of these i's. And this and these are constants. So f i i i. So therefore theta i for every i is a constant. Okay? And so what that tells you is that the, the way that the angles evolve is just with uniform angular velocity. So therefore, if you were to look at the evolution of the system, you write it in terms of canonically conjugate variables of these action angle variables, look at the angle, and the angle is just wrapping around, each angle is just wrapping around with some constant angular velocity, okay? So the dynamics, if this happens, and there are n such angles, is particularly simple. There is no chaos because we know that all these degrees of freedom are just evolving in a very simple way, okay? So these integrable systems are not chaotic, and incidentally, these, you know, these uh, surfaces on which these evolve, these thetas evolve, are called invariant tori. So for those of you who are familiar with, you know, have done Hamilton-Jacobi theory, so the motion of this, so the evolution of this kind of classical system, so which is a constant, so theta i is just equal to some omega i t plus phi i, so the motion is trivial, I mean, not chaotic. and on n invariant tori. So these are systems which are not chaotic, okay? So the initial attempt to understand chaos in quantum systems was to try to look at analogs of these in quantum systems, okay? And then see in what, okay, first of all, in some sense, perhaps even by fiat saying that when you looked at quantum analogs of these, those would not be chaotic, and I'll come to that in just a second, and then see what features in the quantum system pointed to that lack of chaos, and then define chaos in terms of that feature, okay? So that was the idea. And so we'll see that that feature which tells you whether a system is chaotic or not in the quantum case is what was called the energy level spacings uh, distribution, the statistics of energy level spacings uh, we'll come to that in a second, okay? All right, so this, is, so this is the classical system. Now, if you wanted to look at the quantum version of this, suppose I gave you a classical Hamiltonian, which has this property, and now I said, let's do quantum mechanics with this, okay? So the simplest way in which you can go from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics here is by quantizing these trajectories. So these are periodic trajectories. So the motion of this classical system is going to be periodic. And we know how to quantize periodic classical motion, okay? So is that something which all, everyone here is familiar with? Okay, so, so that's something which goes by the name of the Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization condition. Have you seen something like this? So this is the way you would quantize a system like this. You would look at these trajectories, and you would say that all of these periodic trajectories are not going to be allowed. Only those periodic trajectories which have this property in some suitably defined way in terms of the action, action angle variables are allowed in the quantum system, okay? So that will tell you which of these trajectories are allowed when you quantize the system. And then, once you know what the allowed trajectories are, from that you can find out what the allowed values of energy are. So I'm sure that in some course in quantum mechanics, you probably employed this for simple systems like a uh, one-dimensional harmonic oscillator or maybe a particle in a box. Here you just have to do it for, you know, more complex system with a larger number of, of these uh, closed bound trajectories. Okay. But then what's going to happen when you do that is, so the, so the quantization condition basically comes from the fact that there's an integer set. So now, so when you do that, and you look at what the allowed values of energy are, so typically what's going to happen is that the allowed values of energy, typically, are going to end up looking like this. So the energy is going to be some function, 
summation over i, f i n i, not the Cauchy summation over i, summation over set n i, f i n i. So the allowed trajectories are for each for each of these, you know, periodic orbits are going, for, you know, periodic orbits for each degree of freedom are going to be labeled by some n. There's going to be an energy corresponding to that. And so that is this F i n i. Uh, okay, actually, I think you say F i n j, maybe just to make the notation simpler. So I look at the ith such trajectory for the ith degree of freedom, and its energies are going to be some function of these integers. And then you say that, you know, the total, the energy that's allowed for the system is going to be the sum of, you know, different kinds of motions along each of these different trajectories, each of which comes with something like this. So finally, it's going to be a sum of this sort, where these are going to depend on the allowed values of integers. So if this seems strange to you, suppose you just take a simple case of a particle of a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator, you know that a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator has energy eigenstates which have these values. I'm assuming that the omega is the same in both directions. And you can see that okay, summation over uh, the allowed values of energy are going to you know, have these values. So um, that's the summation of j, nj. And so this has this form where these functions are particularly simple. They're just nx plus one half and ny plus one half. But in general, they could be more complicated. So based on this observation, there was a conjecture made by Berry and I think this is pronounced Taber. I'm not sure if it's Taber or Tabor, the Berry Taber conjecture, which said the following, that if you were to take such an integrable system, which is something which is classically integrable, and quantize it so that you could do this, and then so you get a bunch of energy levels, which are the energy levels of the Hamiltonian, now, if you go and look in that part of the spectrum where you have a lot of energy levels, where you have a high density of states, okay? So you look at some energy window in this region where there's a high density of states. You fix the size of your energy window, count how many energy states you have in that window. And take that window, again, put it in some other part where you have a high density of states and keep doing this. And look at the statistics of these of the number of energy levels that you have in some particular window, you would find that the statistics are Poissonian, that this would look like a Poisson distribution. So one way of seeing that is, imagine that you again have this kind of harmonic oscillator, but an n-dimensional harmonic oscillator, and to keep things simple, actually in this case, this, what I'm about to say, simplifies things. Imagine that, okay, so you have this n-dimensional harmonic oscillator. How am I doing on time, uh, harmonic oscillator. So it's energies. So let me ignore this, you know, the zero point energy factors of one half and so on. So it's energy is going to, the allowed values of energy are going to look like this. So there's going to be a summation over j, nj, omega j, and um, so for every set of nj's, you're going to have a different value of energy. So the allowed values of energies are going to look like this. Now, if you assume that there is no special relation among the omegas. So here, for instance, this particular case, there was something special. So this particular case had this symmetry where I could change x to y and y to x, and nothing would change, right? So it was a symmetric harmonic oscillator, but that's a very special case. Suppose you just took a very, a more general case where you had these n harmonic oscillators, but there was nothing special about them, okay? Uh, meaning there's no such symmetry that these omegas in general would be different. So then the energy eigenvalues would look like this, okay? And so once you got to a part of the spectrum, so now of course, you know, if you're looking at the very low energy eigenvalues, the very low energy eigenvalues in some sense would correspond to only very specific allowed values of nj, 
meaning if you wanted to look at the ground state of this, so the ground state of this would correspond to nj equal to 1 for whatever was the smallest omega j and 0 for everything else, okay. So that's special, that's picking out one oscillator and similarly, you know, for the low-lying energy states, you might have something special like that happen. Once you get to the middle of the spectrum, where you have a large density of states, then <clears throat> the conjecture is, or you know, something that you can see from this if these are random is, that all of these are going to start contributing equally, meaning that if I look at some particular energy eigenstate in the middle of the spectrum, there is no reason for some, for the NJ of some oscillator to be equal to zero. Right? So they would all contribute. And in fact, if you were looking in the middle of the spectrum, you would find energy levels which come from, in some sense, an unbiased contribution from all of these oscillators. So you've thrown away the special features by not looking at the lowest energy states, but now looking at the higher energy states towards the middle of the spectrum. And then what happens is that if these are, if these omega j's are random, that there's nothing, no special relation among them, and if you were to now look at the energy statistics in the way that I just told you, you will find that you have Poisson statistics, which means that if you looked at an energy window of size delta E and asked how many states there are in that energy window, right, and you, and you looked at, and you look at the distribution of that, that would obey the Poisson distribution. So you would have the probability of, <coughs> excuse me, having n states where lambda is the average number of states in a given energy window. No, no, it's, okay, so first of all, at the level of mathematics, if you have this distribution, right, then you know that this quantity is going to be the average of this distribution, right? So here the thing is, so what are we doing? What we're saying is that you fix the width of the energy window, okay? You look at a large region where you, of, of this, uh, of the energy spectrum of this, where you have a large number of states, you take that region, you know, this thing, this window, and keep putting it on different regions of this, of the part of the spectrum where you have a large number of states and you keep counting how many energy eigenstates you have within that window. So you put the window here, count. You put the window there, count. And, but all the time, make sure that wherever you're putting the window is a place where you have a large density of states, okay? And then you just look at the statistics of that. You plot a histogram. And the claim is that if, you know, because the energies originate from something like this, that is going to be Poisson. No, no, it's, well, I mean, you can, you can do better than that. You can show that if the energy does indeed have this kind of form, where these are integers and these are sufficiently random, then this kind of process will actually yield a Poisson distribution. The assumption is that if you go to the middle of the spectrum, you know, like any, for any of these quantum integrable systems which have their origins in a classical integrable system, in some sense, if you like, the assumption is that this sort of quantization works. So once this, once you believe that, okay, and you go to the middle of the spectrum, then this kind of thing will happen, just from statistics, okay. So, so integrable systems Poissonian energy level statistics which results in something like this. Now one of the things that you can calculate from a Poisson distribution is in this language what's called <coughs> the level spacing distribution, okay? So what that means is that now you go to the middle of this of the spectrum where you have a large density of states, so you're doing this, 
And there you just look at the energy levels that you have and you order the energy levels, let's say, in descending order of energy. Okay? So you take the energy levels, you order them in descending order of energy. And what you can do is you can calculate the difference in energy between successive levels. Okay, so this is E1, E2, E3, so on. And you can calculate delta E for this, you can calculate delta E for this, and keep going. And you can ask what is the distribution of that? What is the distribution of these energy level differences? Okay. Okay. So as I told you, so the two things, all right? One is Suppose you didn't quibble about where this was coming from. An intuitive argument for why something which looks like this, where these omegas are sufficiently random, these are integers, being Poissonian is just something which comes from statistics. Okay. Right. But then you can ask, well, wh what is the argument for the energy levels themselves to look like this? I mean, the energy eigenvalues. Is that because those are the only two things, right? In asking why is it Poissonian, there are two steps. One is justifying why the energy would look like that. And the other is having justified that, how do you show this happens? So the second thing is a standard thing which you encounter in statistics. So, it's, so in some sense, the non-trivial thing is really the first one, okay? So here we are making an assumption here, if you like, that this sort of quantization works, okay? That you have, I mean, it's, it, you can, it's more than just a very crude assumption. There are sophisticated ways of, of trying to argue for these things in using what's called WKB theory. But the non-trivial step is to say that you have some sort of quantization like this, which you can effect in terms of the action angle variables because those are also canonical variables, from which you can now quantize the energies of motion along these tori, and then the, the general energy is going to be some sum of those, okay, which will look like this. Now, it doesn't even, I guess, have to be linear in these ends. I mean, I took a particular example, which is simple, where you assume that this was, you know, n uncoupled harmonic oscillators with no this definite relationship between their frequencies is to keep things simple. But so, so that's sort of the important thing. Okay. So integral systems have Poissonian energy level statistics. So what that means is that if you say that this is the way the energy levels occur in a given window, then you can show that the distribution of these P of S the power of minus s and what is s? So s is equal to delta e divided by e mean where e mean is something called the mean level spacing. Okay. So what you do is you order these energies, order the differences between the energies, so that gives you another um, list. And from the differences between the energies, you can calculate what the mean difference is of the energies. You just take the mean of that list. That is E mean. And then you look at all these energy differences that you have calculated. You write those in units of the mean level spacing. Okay, so that gives you something that's dimensionless, which I'm calling S here. And so you can show that if you have Poissonian statistics, then the distribution of P of S is exponential. P of S is going to fall off exponentially with e to the power of, with, you know. It's going to fall off like this. So what this is telling you is that large delta E's are going to be very, very improbable, right? That, you know, if you look at this, so the probability that two successive levels have a huge energy difference between them is something that's going to be small and exponentially small. And in fact, this is monotonically decreasing as a function of S. So what's most likely is that if you look at two of these levels and look at the energy difference between them, that energy difference is going to be very, very small is, is what's most likely. And then as the energy difference increases, the probability goes down. Okay. So this is an indicator of integrability, okay? Energy level spacing statistics. Now, what we would ideally like to do, of course, is in order to classify a quantum system as integrable, 
we would like to be able to calculate these action variables in the quantum case and look at the quantum version of this condition. So the quantum version of this condition is this. Yeah, because n equal to 0 for random omegas is just as good as anything else. Yeah. The quantum version of this notion of integrability is this. So instead of talking about n functionally independent quantities, I'm now going to talk about n functionally independent operators, okay? So n functionally independent operators. So let me just write down what I want to define and then I'll just mention one caveat. So again, functionally independent in quotes, functionally independent operators, I, I, if you like, I can put a hat on top now to indicate that these are operators. And once again, these have to have the property So this would be the analog of this. This is what we would mean by a system being integrable uh, in a quantum mechanical sense. But it turns out that there are a couple of caveats which um, come with this sort of definition, with the sort of you know, importing this idea to the quantum context. One is what you mean by a degree of freedom in a quantum, uh, for a quantum system. Okay. So let me just give you a, again, I'm not going to, try to resolve the issue, but let me just show you where the issue comes from. So typical quantum systems which we are interested in, in a context like this, for instance, could be spins on a lattice. So imagine that you have some lattice, say a one-dimensional lattice, and sitting at each lattice point, you have a spin, okay, a quantum spin. And let's say there are n lattice points, so now here's the question. Would you say that in a, in a system like this, the number of degrees of freedom is n? If, if this were a classical system and these were classical spins, that's what you might say. But in the quantum case, there's the additional problem that each spin has its own Hilbert space, right? So, so if these were spin half objects, at each lattice point, you have a two-dimensional Hilbert space. If these were spin one objects at each lattice point, you'd have a three-dimensional Hilbert space, and so on, okay? So then the question is, if you were counting the number of degrees of freedom, would you say that the number of degrees of freedom is n, the number of lattice sites, or would you say it's the dimension of the local Hilbert space times n? So now the thing is that, you know, this is something which is not easy to resolve. However, the point of view that's adopted is that no matter what that is, at least in this case, you know that as n, n increases, the number of the 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 num the dimension of um, sorry the uh, actually yeah the, the, as n increases, you are uh, okay. Sorry, actually, I, I take back what what I said. So, if you had n of these n lattice sites, and let's say you had a two-dimensional Hilbert space here, two-dimensional Hilbert space here, two-dimensional Hilbert space here, and so on. The total Hilbert space dimension is two to the power of n, okay? And each spin has a Hilbert space dimension of two. So now when you have to define the number of degrees of freedom, what do you go with? You go with n, you go with the dimension of the Hilbert space, you go with the dimension of the local Hilbert space times n. So these, you know, so these are, hmm. no, you won't. You won't go with the dimension of the Hilbert space. I'm just saying you won't. Sure, 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 sure. Because for a classical, for a classical system, the equivalent of the number of dimensions of the Hilbert space is just the number of microstates, and you won't go over that. I'm just saying that there's another thing here which you might consider. So it's really an issue of whether you would go with n or you would go with the dimension of the local Hilbert space times n. And the point is that no matter which one you go with, what you know is that as n increases, the number of degrees of freedom is increasing linearly with n. All right. So often that is good enough for you in order to classify the system as, as integrable, if you can find these 
integrals of motion, these operators, where, and the number of these operators is increasing extensively with the system size, the number that commutes with the Hamiltonian, you say that the system is integral without going into details of, you know, whether it's going as d times n or n. So that is one um, way out of this, out of defining the number of degrees of freedom and defining integrability. The other thing which is perhaps a little more serious is the following, and you might know this from this, you know, this having learned quantum mechanics, that there is actually for any Hamiltonian, no matter what Hamiltonian I give you, there is going to be a set of such operators which will have this property. Okay. Can anyone tell me what that set of operators is going to be? We're not talking about any special Hamiltonian here. If I give you any quantum Hamiltonian, my claim is that you can find a set of these i's which have the property that those, these i's are functionally independent. Each one of them commutes with the Hamiltonian and they commute with each other. Okay, uh, maybe what you're saying is right, but I think I heard a, 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 hmm? the projection operators, okay? So you know that there are operators which will project onto, is everyone here familiar with projection operators? Okay, which will project onto the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, right? And these are operators which, so the Hamiltonian can always be written as in this form. Okay, where I labels the energy eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, and PI is the projection operator to the ith state. Okay? So you can always write it like this. And these P's commute with each other because these energy eigenstates are orthogonal to each other. And then if they commute with each other, then clearly each P commutes with the Hamiltonian. Okay? So then you might be tempted to say no matter which quantum Hamiltonian I look at, it is always going to be integrable because I can define these operators and they satisfy this property. This was not a problem that you encounter with a classical system, okay? So this is something which is, okay, so, so the answer to this is, the, okay, the, the way out of this is that we need an additional property of these i's, which is that the i's themselves have to, in some sense, be extensive in the size of the system. Meaning that when you write down the i's in terms of local operators of your, um, you know, assuming that the Hamiltonian itself has local terms, when you write down the i's in terms of local operators of the, you know, the, of the system that the, the Hamiltonian describes, right, the i's should be sums of things which are local. Meaning that if I have, if my system is some lattice like this, the i's that I'm looking at should not contain terms which are products of a spin which is here and a spin which is at that end of the system, okay? That somehow, if it's a sum of products of operators, those individual terms have to be local. And why that is the case, we might, you know, we'll probably go over that again in a little bit more detail in uh, tomorrow's lecture or maybe in the tutorial. But that is something to keep in mind here because this is, you know, commonly a, a thing which generates a lot of confusion. Meaning that you take a Hamil any quantum Hamiltonian, you know that there's a set of operators which satisfies this trivially. So then why isn't it that every quantum Hamiltonian can be labeled as integral? And the reason is that these i's have to have this sort of special property. Projection operators do not have that. Projection operators typically extend over the entire system. So there is no sense of locality in projection operators. And, um, okay. All right. Uh, so, anyway, so the point that I was trying to make was that ideally this is the way you would like to characterize an integrable system quantum mechanic by actually obtaining these and showing that you have these operators which satisfy this algebra. That can be done for certain trivially integrable systems, okay? That can also be done for a special class of in quotes non-trivially integrable systems, but in general it's a difficult exercise to undertake. So a shortcut that is often implemented in studies, especially numerical studies, is to calculate the, the level spacing distribution and check whether that is Poisson. Okay? So you, you somehow numerically obtain the energy eigenvalues of a finite size system, and then you obtain the level spacing statistics and calculate something like this. 
and then try to do it for larger and larger system sizes up to the extent that you can go to with some notion of finite size scaling and see whether it looks like this. Okay, so that is often the practical way of characterizing integrable systems or the practical way of characterizing quantum systems which do not thermalize. Okay, so this is the signature of non thermalization in a quantum system. This is the signature of not having chaos in a quantum system. So then the question is, what is the signature of having chaos in a quantum system? What is the signature of the quantum system actually being thermal? So then it turns out that there's another set of conjectures which characterize that. And that also has to ultimately do, you know, so, so the way of implementing that is also ultimately looking at the energy level spacing statistics. Okay. And um, so let me just, since I'm running out of time, I think I have maybe another five minutes or so. So let me just tell you what that is. And in the next lecture, in tomorrow's lecture, we'll actually try to derive, okay, not derive fully, but at least see how you would attempt to derive what I'm going to write right now. Okay. So the claim is that systems which are chaotic quantum mechanically, so these were the ones which were not chaotic, the systems which are chaotic quantum mechanically, have a P of S which looks quite different from this. And in particular, the common feature of these systems, like chaotic systems, the common feature of all of these systems, aside from certain details which have to do with symmetries, is the fact that P of S goes to zero as S goes to zero. So that's a distinct difference from this. So here P of S is a monotonically decreasing function of S, whereas here, as S goes to zero, P of S goes to zero. Okay? Now, of course, regardless of whether the system is um, chaotic or not, if it comes from, you know, a Hamiltonian which has short range interactions, you would not expect P of S as S goes to infinity to not go to zero. You would expect that no matter what system you're looking at which has this kind of Hamiltonian, if you ask what is the probability of two levels having a huge level spacing, you would expect that to go to zero regardless of whether it's integrable or not. So the main difference is this that P of S goes to zero as S goes to zero. And this has a name, it's called level repulsion. So what it's trying, is, so what this is telling you is that if you thought of levels as being some actual physical objects, then there is something in the nature of these quantum chaotic systems, which is trying to prevent two levels from coming very close to one another, so that there, so that the difference in energies between them can be very small. And that's the reason P of S is going to zero. So level repulsion is the sort of, in some sense, the defining feature of quantum chaos. But it turns out that we can actually do better than this. We can actually calculate what P of S is as a function of S in many cases. Just like in the Poissonian case, we know that it's exponential. So let me just write down a couple of formulas. And um, tomorrow we are going to see where these come from. So it turns out that for one class of these quantum chaotic systems, P of S looks like this. Okay. And this is a class of chaotic systems which belong to what's called the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble or GOE and then there's another class of course you know, there's several classes but let me just talk about two of these. So there's another class for which P of S looks like this. It is 32 by pi squared S squared e to the power of minus S pi pi, and this belongs to what's called the Gaussian 
unitary ensemble or GUE, okay? Oh, sorry, um, yeah. So you can see that in both cases, P of S goes to zero as S goes to zero, but it goes to zero with different powers. Here it goes to zero linearly. Here it goes to zero quadratically, okay? So this is again, here. so this is used as a diagnostic to look for quantum chaos or lack thereof, energy level spacing statistics. And so you write, you take a Hamiltonian, you calculate its energy spectrum in, you know, let's say numerically, and then you obtain this and see which one of the two it looks like. Now, of course, what will happen is that, you know, these are in some sense ideal predictions for a finite size system in which you can do numerics. You are typically not going to see this or that, okay? You will probably see something that's in between and then you have to do some sort of finite size scaling in order to argue for it being one or the other. But if you're wondering where all of this is coming from, okay? So all of this comes from the fact that, from, this, from the basic assertion that if you were to look at the Hamiltonian of a system, which is chaotic, then in a generic basis, not in a special basis, in a generic basis, the elements of that Hamiltonian are going to look random. The components of the Hamiltonian, you write it out as a matrix, when you look at the entries of the matrix, those entries are going to look random, okay? Um, why that's the case, we'll sort of try to <clears throat> argue in some detail tomorrow. And then what you have is, in order to get something like this, you really have to think about the spectrum of the energy spectrum of random matrices. And the thing which distinguishes this category from this category is, for Hamiltonians which belong to this category, it turns out that these random matrices are real symmetric matrices. See, these are Hamiltonians, they have to be Hermitian. But in this particular case, they are not, not only are they Hermitian, they are real symmetric matrices, okay? And it turns out that the physical property which makes them that way is time reversal invariance. Okay, so Hamiltonians which describe systems with time reversal invariance, let's say no magnetic fields. I'm assuming that all of you are familiar with you know, some examples of systems with time reversal invariance. So it turns out that those are described by, you know, those random Hamiltonians with time reversal invariance are ones which in generic bases look like real symmetric matrices with random entries, and then you can argue, as we will tomorrow, that the level spacing distribution looks like this. This ensemble is the ensemble of systems where the Hamiltonians do not have this feature, where there's no time reversal invariance. So in general, in a generic basis, they look complex Hermitian. And then one can show that this is what the level spacing distribution looks like, all right? So the take home message from this is that when you think of quantum chaotic systems, quantum systems which are not integrable, then you have to think of them in terms of random matrices, random Hamiltonians, okay? And so the physics of lack of integrability or the presence of chaos in a quantum system is encoded in random Hamiltonians. So studying the properties of random Hamiltonians, we can understand the properties of quantum chaotic systems. So we will explore that in more detail tomorrow and start with that and then move on to this thing which I've alluded to a couple of times, something called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which is really the most sophisticated way of looking at thermalization in quantum systems. One that goes beyond trying to characterize chaos, which you really need sort of, you know, in this ensemblist point of view of um, looking at statistical mechanics. But the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis has that, but it also has ingredients which allow you to look at quantum systems from an individualist point of view, um, without, you know, making a direct reference to chaos for its classical counterpart. So we'll see how that works out in tomorrow's lecture, maybe some part of Friday's lecture. Okay. Thanks.